service, please walk with us across the street to the parish house for social hour. On your way out, you can greet the minister and a member of the parish committee at that door, or if you're in a hurry for caffeine, slip out the side door and go directly to social hour. And now let us begin our service. Please join me in saying the unison opening words which are printed in your order of service. There are highways in the soul, heights like pyramids that rise far beyond the earth pale and skies, sweeping through the barless skies, or the line where daylight dies. There are highways in the soul. Our 
first hymn is number 1051. We are in the Teal Hymnal. We are still kind of learning this, but I think most of us know it already. There's a line in this song that says, We are the Spirit of God. What did Isaiah Maria Barnwell, who wrote this song, mean by that phrase? And I don't have a, an answer to this question. I just want to throw the question out there, given the topic of today's service. And it's a question that I ask myself every time I hear this song. So please rise as you're willing, and let's sing 1051. <laughs> Experience and to be able to give a true 
<clears throat> so we have no Sunday school this week because it's school vacation week, so I decided to add another hymn in. And we're going to sing number 140. And the reason we're going to sing this is this is a hymn by Felix Adler, who was born in 1851. He was the son of a rabbi. But he decided it was impossible to prove the existence of God. So he founded the Ethical Culture Society as an alternative religious movement, a movement, in his words, not of creed, but of deed. In the late 19th century, the Golden City was often used as hy in hymns as another name for heaven. But in Adler's hymn, the Golden City was one that was built by human beings. Please rise as you're willing and sing number 140. <laughs> silence if you wish, or say your name and tell us briefly what's in your heart this morning.
hold all these joys, sorrows, and concerns of this community, both those spoken and those which remain unspoken in our hearts and minds in the week to come. So may we draw strength from one another and use that strength to help heal the world. We draw together in the spirit of prayer and meditation, first with spoken word, and then a time of silence, and we'll end by singing in response, number 1045. We call on that which gives us strength by whatever name we each may use, or by no name at all. When we read or watch the news, it is easy to feel despair. It can feel that society is overwhelmed with troubles. Yet we are reminded that all around us are those who rise above despair. All around us are people who extend a helping hand to their fellow passengers in the journey of life. We offer gratitude for whoever these people may be in our own lives. And may we find strength within ourselves to reach out to others to offer our hands in turn to those who may need help. May we strengthen the connections between people and may our shared strength sustain us all. And we offer gratitude for life. We give thanks for the sun which shines down upon us and warms the earth and causes spring and flowers to bloom. We give thanks for the support of human communities we may find in this world. We give thanks for being. So may we find moments of peace and joy in everyday life.
is from the essay, What is Religious Naturalism? by Jerome A. Stone. Religious naturalism is a type of naturalism. Hence, we start with naturalism. This is a set of beliefs and attitudes that focus on this world. On the negative side, it involves the assertion that there seems to be no ontologically distinct and superior realm, such as God, soul, or heaven, to ground, explain, or give meaning to this world. On the positive side, it affirms that attention should be focused on the events and processes of this world to provide what degree of explanation and meaning are possible for this life, to this life. While this world is not sufficient in the sense of providing by itself all the meaning that we would like, it is sufficient in the sense of proving enough meaning for us to cope. And the second reading is the poem in the Rachel Carson Wildlife Refuge, Thinking of Rachel Carson, by Anthony Wong. The elements unraveling, traveling and unraveling, groundwater misting into rain, falling back into the groundwater, salt water washed through brackish, fresh water bordering sea. We too, wandering in late March along the upland, among evergreens and bare deciduous and bushes held fast by the last of the snow. The rush and bubble of the tidal river winding through low tide, salt hay, cord, and spike grass. Walking the path between firm ground and marsh. The first time down the path leads to enlightenment. The second to wonder. The third finds us silent, listening to the few gulls lift and caw as we watch the wind, which makes itself known in the seagrass and as it dimples the water, skimming like the sunlight, until a Coast Guard chopper drowns by, for the moment, the drone of cars and trucks in the distance. It was a privilege to read something about Rachel Carson. She's always been one of my heroes not only because of her love of the natural world, but for warning us about what chemicals were doing to damage that world. Hi. Just a note on the um, anthem that the choir is singing today. When um, I picked the piece. Uh, Susan Scholl has listed the poem that it's based on, These Things Shall Never Die, as uh, being by Charles Dickens. And I was looking up more about that, and I wanted to read the poem and see if it matched the lyrics or if there were any changes. And I found one article that said it's not by Charles Dickens, um, but by Sarah Dudney. And, or Dudney. and um, what they based this on was um, Two things. One, they are um, an English professor in Rhode Island, and he said when he read the poem, it just didn't sound like Dickens. And he said, yeah. And if you read Dickens' other poems, because he didn't write that many, he wrote mostly um, novels and, and essays. It really doesn't sound like one of his. And so he went back and found that there was a literary magazine that um, Charles Dickens published. And when he published this literary magazine, it included essays and poems and stories um, by many people of the time, none of whom were attributed in um, that publication. And um, so it was still a mystery until recently um, there was a scholar who uh, came into possession the original literary magazine with Charles Dickens's notes mm -hmm. in there. And in the margins, he had written in who the authors were of each of the publications. And it was a not quite as easy as that, as he said there were some 3,000 little scribbles in all the margins. Um, so it took a lot of research. Um, but he finally determined that um, Sarah Dudney, or Dudney, had um, composed this poem. And indeed, um, in later years, a number of newspapers 
um, when they printed the poem, attributed it to her. And they assumed that was because she sort of asserted herself and said, no, that's mine. And so they did print it with her name on it. And I thought that was an interesting annotation. <clears throat> seems to work pretty well, and it, science doesn't seem to need any supernatural elements. There's no need of an afterlife in science, no need for angels or demons or genies, no need for gods, goddesses, or other deities guiding our lives. Because science has proved so effective in our society, many people in our society are giving up on religion because religions always seem to be full of supernatural elements. 
And this is a social trend that's been going on at least since the 17th century in Europe, when Baruch Spinoza, you've all read Spinoza, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm a philosophy major, and I, I avoided reading Baruch Spinoza. But he rejected the idea that the Bible was divinely inspired, and he raised questions about the nature of God. And as a result, the, the local Jewish community in Amsterdam excommunicated him. He's one of the few Jews who actually got excommunicated. <clears throat> <clears throat> then, but by the 18th century, there were a growing number of free thinkers, people who rejected many of the fundamental doctrines of Western religion. One such free thinker was Thomas Paine, who wrote the pamphlet Common Sense, which did so much to further the cause of the American Revolution. But Paine also wrote a treatise titled The Age of Reason, which called into question the supernatural elements of the Bible. Paine said, if we are to suppose a miracle to be something so entirely out of the course of that which is called nature that she must go out of the course to accomplish it, and we see an account given of such a miracle by a person who said he saw it, it raises a question in the mind very, very easily decided which is, is it more probable that nature should go out of her course or that a man should tell a lie. We have never, can you imagine how that was taken in his day? We have never seen in our time nature go out of her course, but we have good reason to believe that millions of lies have been told in the same time. It is therefore at least millions to one that the reporter of a miracle tells a lie. And Paine said that while he liked the teachings of Jesus, many of the stories about Jesus found in the Bible are lies. It's really worth knowing about Thomas Paine today, because in today's political debates, we hear arguments over and over again that America was founded on the tenets of Orthodox conservative Christianity, yet here is one of America's founding fathers arguing quite forcefully against Orthodox Christianity. But I digress. <laughs> the debate about miracles and supernaturalism continued and accelerated in 19th century New England. Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of our own, because he served as a Unitarian minister for eight years before becoming a full-time writer, infuriated the religious establishment of his day when he said that the miracles of the Bible had been grossly misunderstood. Here's Emerson from his Divinity School address. <clears throat> Jesus Christ belonged to the true race of prophets. He saw with open eye the mystery of the soul, the idioms of, lang of his language and the figures of his rhetoric have usurped the place of his truth. And churches are built not upon his principles, but on his tropes. Christianity became a mythos as the poetic teaching of Greece and Egypt before. Jesus spoke of miracles, for he felt that a person's life was a miracle, and he knew that this daily miracle shines as the character ascends. But the word miracle, as pronounced by Christian churches, gives a false impression. It is monster. It is not one with the blowing clover and falling rain. Needless to say, Emerson took a lot of heat for that, and he was essentially excommunicated from the Unitarian uh, orthodoxy of his day, let alone the Christian orthodoxy of his day. Emerson's younger colleague, Henry David Thoreau, found miracles in his close observations of the natural world. Thoreau said we need to face up to reality as it actually is. This is what he wrote in his book, Walden. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. To live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life. To cut a broad swath and shave close. To drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world. Or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and to be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. So Thoreau was telling us that this life has enough miracles in it. We don't need to add any miracles to it. 
Thoreau remained open to the insights of traditional religious and spiritual wisdom, not just Christian wisdom, but the wisdom that can be found in all spiritual and religious traditions. But he kept his focus firmly on this world. This present life is sufficient, said Thoreau. Be it life or death, death, we crave only reality. And so he did not reject religion, he simply wanted his religion to remain focused on this world, the world that he could directly experience. <clears throat> Many other religious naturalists emerged during the 19th and 20th centuries. Walt Whitman was a religious naturalist because his poetry dealt with the here and now. The sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois has been called a religious naturalist because, again, his focus was on this world, the here and now, and how to make this world better. Religious naturalists often felt uncomfortable in the organized religion of the 19th and 20th centuries. So, for example, the poet James Weldon Johnson, who wrote the words to lift every voice and sing, he wrote late in his life that he felt that he must lack religiosity. But it seems to me he did not lack religiosity. It seems to me he was forced into feeling he lacked religiosity because the only definition of religion that he knew involves supernatural religion. Anyway, fast forward to the late 20th century and the philosopher Jerome Stone began researching various people that he felt could be called religious naturalists. One of Jerome Stone's most interesting discoveries was that religious naturalists cannot be lumped in with religious atheists. Some religious naturalists do choose to use the word God, while others feel that God is no longer a useful concept. And so, Jerome Stone points out that there is the biologist Ursula Goodenough, who calls herself a religious naturalist, and who feels that the natural miracles investigated by her science of biology are sufficiently miraculous that she sees no need to use the word God. By contrast, Bernard Loomer, another religious naturalist, he's the one who gave us the phrase, the interdependent web of all existence. He was a religious naturalist who feels that God continues to be a useful and important philosophical concept. And so religious naturalists feel that they can interpret God in air quotes, in a variety of ways. Some religious naturalists interpret God as the natural laws of the universe, or as a human social construct, or as the processes, the evolving processes of the entirety of existence. <coughs> Other religious naturalists get along fine without God. So if you're a religious naturalist, you get to decide whether to use the word God or not. And yet, all religious naturalists can find common ground in their rejection of the supernatural and their embrace of this world. So I happen to like this aspect of religious naturalism because I feel it facilitates communication across what has been a, a major division in our society. But the search for truth is always communal. So anything that helps us talk across our divisions helps the search for truth. Now, I'm not a religious naturalist. As I've said before, I'm a devoted follower of haven't figured it out yet. In other words, I don't want to put any name to my ill-formed thoughts and feelings. But I guess I can call myself religious naturalism adjacent. I like the religious naturalists I've met in person. I took a class with Jerry Stone 20 years ago, and I admired his humane and unpretentious attitude towards life. And I appreciate the way religious naturalists have dealt with arguments about the existence of God. So I grew up as a Unitarian Universalist, and back when I was a kid, there was this major battle between the humanists and the theists, and that battle doesn't seem to have progressed at all since I was a child. So instead of arguing about the existence of God, what the religious naturalists want you to do is to define what you mean when you say the word God. And that has deepened my own spiritual life. I also appreciate that religious naturalists focus on this world. If we don't have to worry about some supernatural afterlife, this can release our energies to deal with the problems that we face here and now. This also, I feel, releases me to appreciate the beauties of here and now. 
if there's a heaven or an afterlife or reincarnation, it will come in its own good time, in my opinion. In the meantime, here we are with reality all around us waiting to be experienced. Even when the beauties of this world exist side by side with the horrors of this world, I feel it's better, I agree with the religious naturalists that, and feel it's better to face up to the horrors, to do what we can to end them, than to wait for some heaven or afterlife which may never arrive. Our contemporary society does not encourage us to face both the beauty and the horror of this world. Instead, our contemporary society encourages passivity and quietism. Religious quietism pervades our society as when you hear people say, it's in God's hands, or it was meant to be, or whatever happens, happens for the best. I can tell you right there that that one's not true. <laughs> Belief in the supernatural does not need to deteriorate into quietism, and I am firmly allied with those who believe in a God of justice and truth and love. But we live in a world where some religious people, too many religious people, use quietism to prevent necessary change. Religions that teach us that women are meant to be subordinate to men, that white Christians are meant to rule everyone else. People are literally saying that now. Religions that teach us that rich people are rich because they're favored by God. But quietism is also encouraged by our secular society. It's encouraged by a secular culture that teaches us to remain passive consumers of media. And that is a form of anesthesia that's no different from the numbing effects of religious quietism. Both forms of quietism want to convince us that we cannot change the world. So instead of anesthetizing us, religious naturalism encourages the kind of spiritual practices that keep us engaged with the here and now. Think of Henry Thoreau, next to his cabin at Walden Pond, kneeling down in the woods to play, pay the closest attention to something in the natural world than writing w about what he observed in his journal. And remember, too, that his cabin at Walden Pond was a station on the Underground Railroad. He was not avoiding the horrors of his society by kneeling down in the woods, paying close attention. Thoreau was not escaping from the world through supernatural beliefs, nor did he escape from the world by ignoring the realities of injustice. Now, obviously, religious naturalism is not the only kind of religion that engages fully this, with this world, but it does set a high standard for other religious attitudes to match. So I'd like to close this sermon by repeating the second reading we heard earlier, the poem titled, In the Rach Rachel Carson Wildlife Refuge, Thinking of Rachel Carson by Anthony Walton. Before I read this poem, I'll remind you that Rachel Carson was one of the first people to expose the full horrors of the effects of DDT and other toxic chemicals on the ecosystem. So this poem is both an appreciation of the here and now and a recognition of how much needs to be done. Here's the poem. The elements, raveling and unraveling, ground water misting into rain, falling back into groundwater, salt water wash through brackish fresh water, bordering the sea. We too wandering in late March along the upland among evergreens, and bare deciduous and bushes held fast by the last of the snow, the rush and bubble of the tidal river winding through low tide, salt hay, cord and spiked grass, walking the path between firm ground and marsh. The first time down the path leads to enlightenment, the second to wonder, the third finds us silent, listening, to the few gulls lift and caw as we watch the wind which makes itself known in the seagrass and as it dimples the water, skimming like the sunlight until a Coast Guard chopper drowns for a moment.
the drone of cars and trucks in the distance. It's now time to accept the offering. <coughs> this morning's offering, half of it will go to the work of this congregation. The other half goes to the Social Justice Project listed in your order of service. Cashless donations can be made with a QR code printed in the order of service. Ours has been an extraordinarily generous congregation, and on behalf of the congregation, I thank you for whatever generosity you're able to extend. closing hymn is number 153 in the gray hymnal woke up this morning please rise if you're willing and let's sing out